Welcome to Café with Cavanha. Today we have Stephen Pickett, CEO and President at Rignet. Brandon Sullivan, Specialist in Digital Oil and Gas at Rignet. Geoffrey Kemp, Independent Advisor for Digital Transformation in Oil and Gas. Stephen and Brandon are in the US. Geoffrey is in Canada. We invited them to talk about cybersecurity in the oil and gas industry. Welcome, Stephen, Brandon, Geoffrey. It's a pleasure. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Good to see you again, Cavanya. Tudo bem. Tudo bem. Stephen, let me start with you, please. Uh, uh, in, in which activities uh, are the most important cyber incidents in the oil and gas industry? I mean, uh, drilling, subsea, topside, gas transportation. Which ones, please? Um, you, you know, Cavanya, I, I think the short answer is all of them. And I, I would probably answer the question by describing that the, the biggest risks are associated with attacks that could create a, uh, a, a safety incident. And uh, so, of course, the, you know, safety incidents can, can happen in any one of those areas of the energy value chain, um, from the drilling operation to subsea operations, um, even to uh, onshore uh, pipelines as well. And it, as a matter of fact, you know, we've seen a number of attacks that uh, indeed do create um, risk um, to the safety of uh, employees and, and to the general public. Um, in, uh, in, in, in one case, um, I would uh, point out that um, as it relates to pipelines, often the communications to pipelines are um, associated with the satellite connections, in some cases microwave connections, um, and uh, hackers um, can um, and have interfered with pressure um, within pipelines um, that indeed create risk, not just to the business operation, um, but safety and, uh, and environmental risks um, as well. Um, there are, of course, ways to mitigate that risk, um, and I'm sure we'll get into some of those ways, you know, through the through the course of uh, of our conversation uh, this morning. Uh, one of one of the ways is uh, certainly related to using hardware-based encryption um, that can really make the communication link. Um, to um, those pipelines, um, indeed invisible um, to, uh, to potential bad actors. Um, in addition to that, an another example of uh, you know, trouble um, that can create a, a safety incident um, relates to uh, botnet attacks. Um, there have been um, many um, botnet, attack botnet attacks in oil and gas where a, where a bad actor can, and again has, um, taking control of uh, systems, in, in some cases very important um, drilling systems. Um, in this case, things like um, AI-based intrusion detection um, can identify the bad actor entering the network and can allow um, those who are monitoring the network to take action very rapidly in order to wrestle away um, control just as uh, quickly as possible. Hey, one, one other, you know, example of, um, of uh, risks that can affect, again, not only business operation, um, but uh, safety um, occurred in the Middle East um, here very recently, um, where an open satellite link um, to a, uh, a rig um, uh, allowed a bad actor to inject um, data into the data stream. Um, and uh, by injecting data into the data stream, they were able to redirect um, communication to one of their servers. Um, so uh, basically the bad actor was then gathering information um, from that rig, and information could include things like passwords um, to, uh, to get into uh, other systems. Um, and recovering um, from that attack required literally shutting down um, that, uh, that rig for, uh, for a period of time. So, um, you know, no doubt um, you know, there's, there, there are substantial um, threats to our oil and gas industry um, as a result of bad actors. And, uh, you know, in some cases, these bad actors are state-level um, actors who have very sophisticated tools um, to uh, try to get in and take control of uh, different, uh, you know, different systems um, within, uh, within our, our broader um, ecosystem. And frankly, the, the best way to guard against those attacks um, is, uh, is indeed to use things like hardware-based encryption um, that doesn't interfere with the network performance yeah. and 
AI-based intrusion detection um, because, frankly, particularly those state-level actors are using AI themselves um, in order to uh, in order to make make their attacks more sophisticated. So the only way to deal with that is to uh, also use AI-based tools um, to uh, to stay ahead of them. Good, uh, Brendan. Do you have any any uh, I mean uh, real examples that you can bring, of course, public ones? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. So. <laughs> Um, Steve's absolutely right. I mean, and just taking kind of public numbers, right? The Homeland Security from the U.S. has said in 2015 all the way through 2019 that over 53% of all the attacks worldwide have been against the energy sector. You know, that includes the power grid, but, but uh, and these are state-level actor attacks. Um, we have uh, not only been beefing up our network security, but we've even been rolling out, we RigNet, uh, product lines like our Enhanced Cyber Services, which is an AI-backed uh, managed SOC specialized in energy to help overlay very good security teams and augment them with world-class tools to try to identify uh, threats and then block them. Um, we're seeing uh, a, a constant increase. Like if you really just take the last eight months, year to date, we've seen attack profiles uh, go from you know, scanning your network hundreds of times a day to real multi, multi-vector probing attacks to four or five attempts per business day per customer, right? So there's this, there's this war going on and, uh, and they come in all flavors, but um, you know, we're, we're very focused on protecting the networks because because of the type of company we are. And we also believe that because we can see all the bits flowing across the network, not only just of the drillers, but their tenants, the operators, and the oil field services, we're in a good position to be able to detect anomalies and help close them off. Um, so, so the types of um, threats we see come in various flavors. They are people using man-in-the-middle attacks to just get on networks to try to get back to the corporate headquarters. They might be trying to find out about an M&A transaction and get an economic advantage. Yeah seeing people attempt to get from the secondary systems to get to the primary HSC system. So, you know, now you're getting onto, you know, either the vertical stabilizers or the drill room or the blowout preventer. Now, fortunately, you know, most of those systems are air gaps. They're, they're kind of hard to get to. But with regulation like, so like BESI, the Well Plan Act, where you need to start uh, sending blowout preventer data back to shore so the government can see that you're running your tests, as this IoT interoperability keeps growing, um, unless you're really upfront and prepared for it and really putting in some very sophisticated security, we're starting to punch holes in those air gaps. Yeah. Fortunately, we haven't seen anybody get to those really sensitive systems that, that can create a major uh, accident, industrial accident, but, um, but we're seeing the attempts go, go up considerably. Okay, excellent. Geoffrey. What you can bring to us in terms of uh, risk and accidents for the oil and gas industry? Uh, well, I, I completely agree with uh, with uh, the, our, your colleagues from uh, from Rignet. The um, problem that the industry, if I were to summarize, is that the same technologies the industry is using to improve its performance, which includes adoption of Internet of Things wireless technologies, artificial intelligence, all of these exact same tools are being used by uh, bad people to automate the task of attacking. And so it is a kind of war of technology against technology, if you like. I know we, we watch uh, Star Wars with you know two robots fighting each other well we're already seeing two robots fighting each other uh, the robotic attack from outside uh, is is uh, being uh, uh, repelled by robots artificial intelligence detection engines on uh, our energy infrastructure side so the energy industry is at the very front line of uh, security challenges associated with new technology. And what's causing this is, the, as, as they've, uh, Steve and Brendan pointed out, the greater attack surface 
as we add more technology to solve the problems the industry faces, we create more places where bad actors can attack. And because no one part of the armor is, uh, uh, is uh, 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 ignored by the bad actors, every part of the armor must have the same level of uh, security associated with it. And this means it, it, why it, the hardening of that armor through uh, hardware, air gaps, and much more sophisticated uh, technology <clears throat> to detect and repel attackers is so important. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, for, for you, Geoffrey, uh, using the same uh, terms that you used before, uh, so uh, the risks are, are increasing a lot because the connections are increasing too? Yes, the risks are uh, certainly increasing. And uh, for the most part, teams in oil and gas who are exploring digital innovations and new technology, uh, security is often a secondary concern with the primary concern being operational reliability, uh, safety, and performance. So the industry is obsessed, of course, with the performance of its infrastructure, hardware, pipes, and uh, blowout preventers. And it is slowly adopting the same level of vigilance uh, with its new softer um, uh, aspects of its business, which are uh, data, telecommunications, cyber, and, and, uh, and related. Um, and uh, while the, t the industry doesn't seem yet to have as much uh, commercial attacking, uh, there is still, and we haven't discussed this, but phishing attacks and denial of service attacks are still very common in other parts right. of the industry, not just in the upstream, but in the downstream. Yeah. In the midstream in particular. Yeah. And in the, yeah, particularly in North America. And it's because the, mid, uh, the activists and bad actors now recognize that it may be very difficult to attack any one well, but because the wells all flow into a central point, midstream assets, that's pipeline he uh, heads, gas plants, and so forth, it's very effective to attack those assets because they, can, they become a front end uh, to a great deal of the rest of the, uh, of the uh, 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 energy industry. And, and if I could jump in, um, it is kind of a perfect storm of two things colliding. Um, you know, all of this digital transformation, right? Uh, the industry needs us to get to back to 40% margin, but on $40 a barrel of crude, right? And the only way to do that is to lower the operating costs, right? Because it's the big budget, particularly offshore. And that's forcing them to interconnect these things and use predictive analytics, predictive maintenance, and AI. Um, and then, so we're seeing that when, a, you know, a major can, can um, reduce their non-productive time by 1%, they can get a billion dollar a year savings, right? Um, and so that type of money attra attracts attackers and hackers like moths to a flame. So it's forcing them to rapidly, the industry's doing rapid change where it's historically been pretty change averse, right? Um, and physical, not digital, um, because of that prize. And so, you know, the world of AI combined with IoT requires you to network everything together because the more you network, the bigger this positronic brain gets and the faster it learns. And that, we're just not really prepared to have all the defenses in place as quickly as we're networking everything together and, and particularly systems that weren't networked before. And then you have the other problem that there's a gigantic uh, negative unemployment rate of cybersecurity specialists worldwide. And so when the downturn of energy happened, you know, now four years ago, those people got laid off. They were seen as insurance and overhead, right? And they, they left energy entirely. They're not coming back. They got snatched up by other verticals. Um, and so you've got this problem uh, where you, know, you need to get your shields up much faster than they're going up, and, uh, and it's a race. And, 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 and let me introduce, Stephen, uh, for you. Of course, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, 
Stephen, uh, how big is 5G uh, risks coming? And uh, uh, the adventures, of course, 5G is, is bringing for us. So, uh, adding you for your question. Yeah, so in terms of 5G, right, it's going to allow us to transport a whole lot more data. And um, that data is becoming more and more critical um, to the operation. And it's going to allow us to connect more things. And uh, so what I was going to add to Brendan and uh, Jeffrey's uh, comments is that I think the other thing we need to consider as an industry is that you are as weak as your weakest link. And so oftentimes as we connect more and more things, we need to recognize that by quickly connecting those things, we're introducing a risk to the entire ecosystem um, because if there's penetration on just one point in the network, um, then uh, they then bad actors can quickly reach through the network to uh, to critical systems. So it's important that a strategy uh, indeed protects um, everything that's connected um, to the network. And uh, point the thing about five G is it it does have some security features that have been lacking in four G about actually hacking the towers from a from a wireless device. Um, you know, and, and the, the big 4G, 5G network we just deployed in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, we've specialized its private side with, with specific types of, of things we added for the energy sector, sector, knowing that that's the network we're eventually going to move on to narrowband because it's so low latency. Um, and so we are trying to stay ahead of that and put in some, some new stuff right out of the gate before the traffic gets on there we're able to piggyback a lot more AI monitoring into a 5G tower than you can in 4G and particularly 3G and 2G networks. So I remember a lot of the telemetry stuff worldwide is still on like 2G type networks and they're very vulnerable. Geoffrey, uh, please, uh, what are the main plans and actions? Uh, I mean, uh, oil companies and first tier providers, the most important ones of course, should take to avoid losses and uh, to protect themselves in terms of oil, oil uh, attacks and, and cybersecurity? Well, the, the first uh, tactic that um, I see is that the questions of cyber risk and cyber security are elevated to the board level and to the attention of senior management. In Canada, as an example, um, one of Canada's largest oil and gas companies uh, every quarter has a board briefing on the latest cyber issues. This board briefing is coming not from the chief information officer, not from the VP of corporate services, but from the security officer. Well, he's quite a ways down the organization. He's not the most senior individual, but this issue is so important that he uh, is briefing the board. And uh, so this is the first task, uh, is to get educated on the size, the scale, and the impact of cyber issues so that the board uh, can properly challenge management around whether or not they are paying attention to this problem and allocating sufficient resources to deal with those issues. Um, and so it starts, starts with the board. Um, the next tactic um, is to properly resource uh, the teams to tackle the cyber issues. And um, most projects these days should have a specific um, individual or team that is there to address and understand the cyber exposures that new projects are, um, uh, are uh, potentially exposing the company to. And at, at the, in many cases, uh, projects in oil and gas, this is done as an afterthought as opposed to being embedded or built into the project. Uh, so those are two key tactics that, um, uh, that I see uh, that uh, industry in oil and gas uh, is doing and needs to do much more of. Great. And uh, uh, Stephen and Brendan, what do you see as uh, rules to protect the systems companies must do? Uh, take this one? Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I have a few things yeah. as well. So yeah. I'll go down. I completely agree that it starts with education at the top, right? Because 
you know, the cyber world is so jargon heavy. I think we do that to protect people, you know, so that everybody sounds smarter. But um, so it's very <laughs> hard for senior management to even understand what the risks are and how much money they need to spend. So it starts there. But we try to go down a level with our services and come in with kind of a prepackaged set of rules and playbooks so that if nothing else, you, you know, you get some immediate value. And, and so what... Um, what I basically say is that, you know, Rignet's view of the world is, is number one, you know, come in and make sure you have a good monitoring system. So we offer everybody this inside and outside the, the, the firewall penetration testing that runs all the time in the service. And so every week we give them a, a continuous improvement and education report for lower level threats. So you're trying to get ahead of the fact that IT is rolling out a bunch of servers that left some hole open uh, before they become a problem. Um, we also then say, you know, you really need a, a six-layer defense, and it's a constant moving shield, and there'll be no single vendor that can provide them all. You never want it to be a single vendor, and, and you want to constantly be changing it out because your attacks and your threat factors change all the time. But we say, rule number one, encrypt everything. You know, it's not a matter of when you're going to, if you're going to get breached, it's when. And if you don't think it's when, then you're already breached. So at least much harder to open the data after you steal it. Uh, encrypting a network also can do a cool thing called ghosting. You, you know, most people do not just bust through the front door, steal everything, and run out of the building. You know, the average setup of a state-level actor attack is 305 days. It takes that long to probe your network, get to the next level, the next level, till you finally get to what you're after. So you can disrupt that if you can just find them within that 300 days and keep them out of the key systems. So by ghosting a network through encryption, they get lost. They don't know where the network is coming and going from. So it slows them down enough that you can hopefully find them. Then we, uh, we, say, we say protect the director of IT. It's really hard for intrusion detection systems to detect if that one person's been compromised. They're on the networks all the time. They have access to everything. So there are specialized systems you can put in for conditional access to protect that that resource that confuses the defender's AI. And then the other nice thing about conditional access is protect yourself from your third parties. Well, I guess has lots of third parties, a lot of joint ventures. You need a very ruggedized time-based system. Let them go only in for a couple hours and then, and then they do their thing and then you kick them back off your network. And so we've been working a lot with conditional access systems. So encryption, conditional access, Education is a huge component of it because a lot, of, a lot of times you just you trip over these things by blind luck. So you need to get everybody thinking in the correct security posture across your whole company. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the last thing I say is if you are not using AI right now in your defense, you're dead. Like because the defender, the attackers are definitely started all this year. It started kind of earlier this year. They started hooking up AI systems to come in and you got attacks that are changing vectors hundreds of times an hour, and no team of people looking at screens are going to be able to fend that off. They'll get overwhelmed. I don't care how good they are. So the last core element we say is you need to be AI back in your defense or you're doomed. Yeah. And, and to add to that, maybe a, a comment on uh, in, encryption in particular. Um, you know, I th historically, encryption has been done um, using software, and uh, increasingly um, that has been... Um, software encryption has been overcome and it's now getting so easy to overcome software based encryption that literally people can download data from the internet in order to you know, basically break the uh, software based encryption uh, and software based encryption is also very burdensome to the network that's carrying um, the critical data and creating access um, to critical systems. So I think from an industry point of view, we need to do more to embrace the idea of hardware-based encryption that is fundamentally much more um, secure, number one, and number two, doesn't add burden um, to the network uh, as well. Excellent. Let me uh, bring uh, the, the last point for us, please. Uh, uh, how much cost uh, uh, prevention, cyber attacks prevention? Of course, big numbers. and. Uh, how big can, can be a, a, a consequence in terms of a invasion of cyber attacks? And the final comments of each one, please. So as an energy average, um, 
the latest numbers, right, and we get them from a couple of different sources, is to, re to repair a, an, a successful attack in energy, it costs about $17.3 million an attack. So if you think across all industries, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.5 million, but energy is, is higher because the attacks are more sophisticated and you know, the risks are higher. Excellent. Stephen? Some of the numbers have been publicized about specific attacks as well. There was a large maritime player um, recently who was attacked and you know, order of magnitude, um, you know, a couple hundred million dollars to, uh, to recover uh, from that attack. Yeah, and very famously, right, Aramco got an attack a few years ago. It cost them over a billion dollars to clean that one up. Geoffrey? Um, the, the, the attacks and costs of attacks, because of the embarrassment of having to acknowledge that you've been attacked, um, in, in public forums uh, means that the, those who have been attacked are very reluctant to share uh, their data about that. This is, uh, this is a problem because we know that in the world of human viruses, uh, we now shine a bright light on uh, viruses that are exp uh, going out of control like Ebola or swine flu. There's a very, very public now about how uh, governments are tackling uh, these viruses, but we don't do the same thing on the cyber world. And uh, so uh, the data is, uh, uh, you know, or what we can see or what people agree to share um, may not be f painting the full picture uh, as to exactly what is the cost and the consequence. So I would take the data with a very large grain of salt it's likely much higher um, because it is so embarrassing to admit that you had to deal with a $200 million problem. Uh, and uh, certainly if you look at other industries where there has been attacks, uh, though banking in particular, where uh, there's a need to disclose uh, that uh, personal data has been taken, the, the attacks are generally much higher than what you would think. And uh, so, uh, I, as I say, the, the average maybe 17 million is still a very large number, uh, but I suspect it's much higher. Excellent. Yeah, you know, one other you know, consideration um, is, you know, indeed, all the data might not be out there about the impacts of an attack. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, when a vulnerability is identified, it is often communicated. Um, because there's a need to de-risk the fact that you weren't transparently sharing information about a problem to help your customers get that problem solved. Um, and uh, so um, the reality is you need to be able to respond quickly to publicly shared information about network vulnerability or network equipment vulnerability, um, and uh, you need to get those, those vulnerabilities closed um, just as quickly as possible. So you, you can't wait around till the next morning. You really need, you know, seven by 24 uh, awareness um, of those vis of those vulnerabilities in order to get those holes closed. Yep. Excellent. We appreciate this nice conversation with Stephen Pickett, Brendan Sullivan, and Geoffrey Cam. Very good conversation. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you too. Nice to, too. nice to talk together. Good.